Well, here we are, another COVID debunking video, and this time it's about that Yale preprint paper that everybody seems to be talking about. In case you didn't know, researchers at Yale recently posted a preprint study looking into what they're calling post-vaccine syndrome, and it's been picked up by news outlets and influencers, and a lot of things are being said about it. So I read the paper, I got the facts for you, and I'm going to tell you what this paper shows, what it doesn't show, and just generally what I think about it. So let's get into it. I've got the paper, I've got my hair picked out, and I've got IBS. So let's get into a quick rundown of what this paper set out to do. The researchers in this paper set out to define the characteristics among a group of patients suffering from what they call post-vaccine syndrome. This is describing a small number of people who, following COVID vaccination, ended up with long-lasting negative side effects like brain fog, fatigue, and neuropathy. This syndrome has been described as being very similar to long COVID, and like long COVID, there isn't a ton of solid research into exactly what it is, what the people are suffering from, and what we can do about it. I have no doubt that these people who say they're suffering from post-vaccine syndrome exist and are genuinely suffering. I even think it's reasonable to say that a good number of them are suffering from symptoms caused by the vaccine, because the vaccine is an immune insult. It triggers the immune system. Anything that triggers the immune system can have negative consequences, and these people might be suffering from those. I think they do deserve attention from the healthcare system, they do deserve care, and they do even deserve compensation from our government. And of course, they also deserve the truth. They don't deserve disinformation, and they don't deserve to be used by influencers who want to say that they know what's going on with them and use their syndromes to sell products or gain fame and fortune online, which definitely is happening. And I'll talk more about that at the end of the video. But for now, let's stick to the paper. Like I said, the researchers set out to characterize what exactly is going on in these people's bodies, generate hypotheses as to what we can do in the future to better understand what's going on in their bodies, and even maybe generate hypotheses as to potential treatments. This study is not a risk-benefit analysis of COVID vaccines. It is not able to tell you whether or not it was safer to take the vaccine or not take the vaccine. It was also not a population-based study trying to determine the rate of post-vaccine syndrome in the general population. It dealt with a very small cohort, and again, it was just trying to characterize certain things about these individuals. But despite its scope, we already have influencers online saying that it proves vaccine-induced AIDS and that millions of people are suffering from this and a whole host of other nonsense. So let's get into the paper and see exactly what the authors say. The first sentence of the summary says, COVID-19 vaccines have prevented millions of COVID-19 deaths, yet a small fraction of the population reports a chronic debilitating condition after COVID-19 vaccination. Y you influencers just going to just going to gloss over that first sentence. I just wanted to make sure I mention it because there are lots of influencers online who are already making wildly outlandish claims about this paper that it does not even remotely say. Vaccines, including COVID-19 vaccines, can have negative adverse events. And those negative adverse events could manifest as something that we're now calling post-vaccine syndrome. That is entirely possible. However, we have to be honest and include all the information that we have when trying to talk about these things. If we ignore the fact that COVID-19 vaccines have saved millions of lives, then people are going to be misinformed. It's like if you talked about airbags and only focused on the times they injured people instead of saved people's lives. You're kind of painting a dishonest picture. Okay, so now that I've gotten that stuff out of the way, let's get into what the data of this paper actually say. That's the real important part. This study had 42 individuals who say they suffer from post-vaccine syndrome and 22 healthy controls. One important thing to recognize about these cohorts is that everything about them is completely self-reported. So, for example, the post-vaccine syndrome cohort, they are self-reporting when they got the vaccines, when they started feeling symptoms, and how they're feeling overall. Now, part of that is definitely the nature of the syndrome. You do have to believe the patient whenever they are saying that they're feeling unwell and that they're suffering. But the information we do have about these patients ultimately makes the conclusions that we can make extremely limited. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it would be ideal if in this group of people we had a set of tests that were done before the patient got these symptoms and the same set of tests done after the patient got these symptoms. This would allow us to establish a timeline centered around the vaccine where we have a before baseline and an after effect. Instead, we just have what they're feeling like now and we're looking at certain biological markers that they have now. And gathering that information is better than nothing, 
But if we want to study post-vaccine syndrome rigorously, we want to make sure we're studying post-vaccine syndrome. We want to be sure that the biological markers and results that we're getting in these tests actually happened after the patient was vaccinated and weren't there before. Now, of course, it is helped by the fact that there are healthy controls to compare these people to. But again, these are people who are not feeling well compared to people who are healthy. We're not necessarily isolating and studying the cause of what made them have these symptoms, which leaves open the possibility that it might not have been the vaccine that caused these symptoms. And this is discussed by the authors because another possibility that could cause these symptoms that are similar to long COVID is long COVID. It is known that even mild or asymptomatic infections with SARS-CoV-2 can trigger symptoms of long COVID. So the authors do try to rule out COVID itself as something that could be causing the symptoms in these patients. But what they do to rule it out is not adequate in order to actually rule out COVID as a probable cause for these symptoms. So here's what they do, and then I'll explain what I think they should have done. What they did was they asked the patients when their last COVID infection was. Again, this is self-reported. So they break the groups into infected and non-infected. They then test the patients for antibodies to a protein in the SARS-CoV-2 virus called the N antigen. This is a relatively small protein in the outer surface of the SARS-CoV-2 envelope. But this N antigen is not in any vaccines that these patients would have gotten. So the logic goes that anybody who has antibodies to this protein has encountered SARS-CoV-2. This logic is all well and good, but we know in the literature that people who have been vaccinated against SARS-CoV-2 and already have prior immunity to it don't necessarily create antibodies to the N antigen. This is because the immune response to spike is strong enough that it's able to clear the virus really efficiently before the body mounts an immune response to the other antigens that the virus has. And sure enough, there were patients in this cohort where they said that they had an infection with SARS-CoV-2, but they did not have antibodies to the N antigen. So this is not an effective way to rule out SARS-CoV-2 infection as a possible cause for these symptoms. I think what would have been better to do would be a T-cell antigen test. T-cells are immune cells that respond to proteins of foreign pathogens in a way that's different than antibodies do it. Antibodies will recognize a three-dimensional site on a specific protein, whereas T-cells will recognize what we call peptides. They're little pieces of foreign protein that get chopped up and presented on the surface of cells. I think seeing if these patients' T-cells react to N antigen peptides would have been a more sensitive and reliable way to ensure whether or not they've had an exposure to SARS-CoV-2. But I also think the strength of the study suffered a lot from the fact that they only had one blood draw from each of these patients at one particular time point. This study really could have benefited a lot from any sort of longitudinal testing, meaning taking blood samples from the patients at multiple time points over the course of several months. It would have really helped to have more people in the cohorts because 42 unhealthy individuals versus 22 healthy controls does not make for the best statistics. It would have also helped to have a little bit more than self-reporting to delineate these cohorts. Something as simple as proof of positive COVID tests from clinical labs or anything along those lines. It would have been awesome to see a cohort of people in this study who were suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome since before the pandemic because chronic fatigue syndrome is similar to things like long COVID and post-vaccine syndrome. And those people also feel generally ignored and feel like they're not being heard by the healthcare system. This would have been a really great comparator group of people whose symptoms we know weren't caused by the vaccine, but are suffering similar symptoms and would have been another big step towards isolating the vaccine in post-vaccine syndrome so that we could see if there's anything unique about the people who have gotten COVID vaccines and then have these symptoms. But that wasn't done. And lastly, longitudinal sampling would have just made their data way more robust and would have allowed them to actually answer some of the questions they try to answer in this paper, which we'll see in a few minutes. But that just wasn't done. There was a lot that was not done in this paper that could have been done to make it a lot more robust and convincing, no matter what the results would be. 
But as this preprint stands, it's not really able to tell us much. It cannot isolate the vaccine in this post-vaccine syndrome, and it cannot really give us a good idea of what these patients are actually suffering from. So in the words of the authors, this preprint was meant to be hypothesis generating, meaning it was supposed to generate a data set characterizing these individuals that would inform future experiments. It would allow people to say, hey, this looks interesting. Let's drill into that and try to find more answers. But unfortunately, I don't think that this data set can really generate much that is useful. And it's because the design is just really flawed and is lacking a lot of controls and a lot of robustness that we would need in order to answer these questions confidently that we would need in order to give these people the answers that they honestly deserve. And if that seems harsh, well, this is what scientists do. We critique work. We point out the flaws so that we can design better experiments to correct for those flaws and get more confident answers. And in the words of Akiko Iwasaka, one of the lead authors of this study, she says that this is a work in progress. This paper does not provide all the answers, or really any yet. But it's part of a study within a larger grant provided by the NIH that these researchers are using in order to study this question of what is going on with these people who say that they have these symptoms following a COVID vaccine. And on top of all that, it's a preprint. It hasn't even been peer-reviewed yet. So people being sensationalist about this, even the New York Times writing about it, it's really irresponsible and they're saying a lot of things that are just plain wrong as a result. Now, with those big problems laid out, I really hope that helps you understand the scope of what this paper is and what it can answer and what it can't answer. Now, I just want to go through a few of the data points that a lot of people are talking about when it comes to this paper and explain what might be right and what is definitely wrong. One thing that people seem to be talking about a lot is this idea of T-cell exhaustion, that this paper does float, but it does not even remotely show T-cell exhaustion in these people. So what they did in the relevant experiment here is they took immune cells from the blood samples of these patients and looked for specific markers or specific proteins on the surface of these cells that identify them as specific kind of cells. And from these results, they concluded that the people with post-vaccine syndrome had exhausted T-cells. But this is not how you test for exhausted T-cells. T-cell exhaustion is a thing that can happen in cases of, for example, chronic infections, where a virus is sitting around in your body for a long period of time, activating and deactivating and just giving your immune system a really hard time. And there is a way to test for it. It's a functional test. It tests the activity of the T-cells and what they're actually doing. These markers can be found on regular non-exhausted CD8 T-cells or exhausted CD8 T-cells. It does not differentiate between the two. So no, this paper is not showing that people with post-vaccine syndrome have T-cell exhaustion. I honestly think the setup of this paper was not good, and that can be fine in a exploratory initial characterization paper, but these experimental setups are just, some of them are just really bad. And this next one is just disappointing because it looks at Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV, is known as the virus that causes mono in a lot of people. It's a DNA virus that can lie dormant in your cells and reactivate at particular times. And one hypothesis as to what's causing this post-vaccine syndrome in a rare number of people is that maybe Epstein-Barr virus is reactivating and causing a lot of fatigue and other symptoms. That's a hypothesis that would be interesting to explore, but here they don't do it correctly. All they do is they look for antibodies to Epstein-Barr virus, and they find that people with post-vaccine syndrome have more antibodies to Epstein-Barr virus. The authors say that this suggests a reactivation event, but you can't know that without more blood samples. The proper way to identify Epstein-Barr reactivation is to at least get a baseline. Some people might have more reactive antibodies in their blood at any given time to Epstein-Barr virus, and some people might not. If this is the baseline for these people, then it's not evidence that Epstein-Barr virus is reactivating. If we had multiple blood samples at different time points from these people, and it showed that these antibodies were increasing or decreasing, then that would be more suggestive of a reactivation event. Also, an easier way to directly gauge if Epstein-Barr virus is reactivating is just to test for its DNA in the patient's blood. If it's reactivating and then deactivating, you will see these levels of DNA go up and down. But they don't do that here, and it would be really easy to do, so I'm not sure why they didn't. 
So ultimately, again, because of the setup, you can't really make strong conclusions about this experiment. And it's disappointing, to be honest. The last thing I wanted to talk about here is their spike protein measurements. One of the experiments they do is they test for the presence of spike protein in the patient's blood. And they find that people who are suffering with post-vaccine syndrome have generally more spike protein in their blood than their healthy control counterparts. Now, this is the part in the preprint where they use that long COVID cohort from another study that I mentioned earlier, and their spike protein levels are actually closer to the levels of spike protein in the post-vaccine syndrome patient blood. Which is interesting, sure, but again, this paper really suffers from not being able to rule out SARS-CoV-2 infection at any time. So we don't know where this spike protein would be coming from. I've seen some people saying that this shows that the COVID vaccine is producing endless amounts of spike protein in these people, and... Let me tell you, that is just not possible. It can't do that. What's more likely is that these are either from undiagnosed SARS-CoV-2 infections, or they could be from immune cells holding on to spike antigen, which we know is a thing that can happen. But this does lead into the one hypothesis that I could maybe get behind from reading this preprint. Again, it's a maybe. I'm not really convinced, given all the limitations of it. But they also do an experiment where they look at antibodies against spike protein in both cohorts. And the post-vaccine syndrome cohort consistently has high levels of anti-spike antibodies. Whereas the healthy controls, as you get further away from their last reported day of COVID exposure, which again is self-reported, granted, those levels do go down consistently post their last exposure, while the post-vaccine syndrome patients don't. Again, it's not super convincing. There are tons of limitations here, but that is maybe the one hypothesis I could generate from this data, is that maybe these patients have some problem regulating their immune response. But I wish they included other antibodies in this experiment just as a control to see if maybe it's just a general immune system thing or if it's specific to spike protein in these patients. But they didn't do that, so we don't know. So yeah, this preprint has a ton of issues that New York Times and Joe Rogan and influencers who want to just get clicks and mislead you aren't going to talk about. But we need to talk about these things if this is going to be in the conversation in the general public. People need to be better at reading and interpreting scientific papers, and the media especially needs to be really careful about interpreting scientific papers, especially when they're preprints. This preprint, as it is, is just not well designed. The data are not strong or robust enough to give us concrete, confident answers either way of this problem. And it's mostly unfortunate for the patients because they deserve answers. And I feel like all of the hoopla generated by this preprint is going to result in a lot of disinformation, which again, we're already seeing from influencers, which is just going to muddy and confuse the waters and if anything, delay these patients getting the truth and answers that they do need in order to be healthier and happier. And that brings me to what I wanted to talk about toward the end of this video, which is people profiting off of selling things to people suffering from syndromes that aren't well understood. It's been happening forever. And it's just something I want people to be aware of and careful about because it can come from unexpected places. Even one of the authors of this preprint, uh, Putrino, I believe his name is, he has been sharing some concerning things online, which is a, uh, a supplement that has been sold by COVID disinformation spreaders as something that is supposed to protect you against people who are shedding vaccine. Yeah, they marketed it to people who were not vaccinated because that's most of their audience as something that they need to buy to protect themselves against people who did get vaccinated and were shedding vaccine however the hell that happens yeah it, it's it's not good obviously there's no evidence for this but it's pseudoscience coming from an unexpected source anyway i hope that helps you understand what this preprint is and what it isn't it's not giving us concrete answers as to how many people are suffering from post-vaccine syndrome and even what post-vaccine syndrome really is. It's not showing that people are suffering from vaccine-induced AIDS. Stop with that nonsense, please, for the love of God. And it's just not a well-designed or groundbreaking study. If you want to read the paper for yourself, I have it linked in the description along with some other resources, as well as everything else I talked about in this video. You can read that for yourself and inform yourself rather than, you know, listening to Joe Rogan or reading a headline. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.